My day job is an ENT um, head and neck surgeon, and uh, obviously I see voice patients as part of that, but I see a, lot, a wide spectrum of uh, people who have um, uh, laryngeal disorders in its sort of broadest terms. So people have got cancers of their voice box, uh, people have had surgery to improve their, their breathing. And um, we're very aware that, um, you know, some people have some very abnormal voices as a result of, uh, of surgery. And, um, you know, we examine the patients, you see things moving. And um, before, I never really took uh, a lot of notice. But since I used stroboscopy to examine these patients, you could actually see what structures uh, were actually vibrating. And actually, it was extremely illuminating because the things that you thought were sort of collapsing in and potentially blocking off the airway were actually vibrating. And that sometimes it's the only thing that was actually vibrating at all. So you might have been tempted to remove that thing that was flopping down into the airway. But actually, if, I'd, you know, if you'd done surgery on that or if you don't examine the patients to, to look at the structures that are actually vibrating, then uh, you could actually damage the only voice that uh, uh, these people have, uh, have, have got. Um, it wasn't until I started uh, doing the work with, uh, with Catherine um, that actually I began to appreciate uh, that you could actually categorise these sort of uh, qualities of voice uh, in a little bit more detail. In the literature, there, there have been various descriptions of, of some of the structures that are involved, but I think this is an attempt to sort of bring together uh, some of the findings that uh, um, we uh, I've seen uh, with examining uh, um, the singers. Uh, and the various vocal effects, and also linking it to some of the clinical findings that, that I see. Some of the qualities of the images, the videos, I'm afraid, are just a little bit poor, but uh, this is a, they're not very common, these problems, uh, but hopefully it'll illustrate the sort of similarities and, and uh, dissimilarities. So um, basically, we all know that uh, for normal voice, you have uh, your vocal folds that vibrate, and you have to have a power supply, and of course, and you have the filter for the, for the vocal tract. Um, the, uh, we know that the supraglottis, uh, which the supraglottis is basically the bit above the vocal cords as part of the, uh, of the voice box itself, the larynx. Um, we know that the, um, the supraglottis can affect the voice in lots of different ways, and we've already shown sort of demonstrations of the effects of the modes and how you get this sort of constrictions of the, of the false cords, particularly the area sort of folds, sort of folding in, and this sort of really, uh, and you can hardly see uh, the vocal folds in some of the, uh, the more metallic modes, but we know that they are actually vibrating underneath. So um, in speech, actually, um, they use, um, use of the false chords is actually a normal phenomenon in part, so you don't use it all the time, but you use it for things like shouting, uh, for glottal onset, and uh, also for vocal effects, if you just want to sort of do a bit of, you know, uh, raspiness to the voice, then you, use, you bring in uh, that. And that's all considered as sort of part of normal voice use. Um, and the effects are that it, uh, it does affect, the use of superglottis actually affects the way the vocal folds vibrate. Um, and it also, because of that constriction, it affects the acoustics by narrowing that sort of the bit of the epiglottis uh, and the, the immediate superglottis. Um, so that can, if, if those patterns become entrenched, uh, then uh, they can actually lead to what we, the commonest voice disorder we see, which is a muscle tension uh, disorder. And this has been well described in sort of the, the classic sort of uh, uh, three types, I suppose, uh, are that you get this sort of medial constriction of the, uh, of the false cords uh, here, and then you get this sort of anterior posterior constriction, and then you can get the whole supraglottis actually collapsing down. But the, the difference here is that these people go into this mode of speaking and it's constantly like that. Uh, uh, or they, re they relax at times, sometimes if they can. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, they've got this sort of constant rough sort of uh, quality uh, to the voice in general. or well, it depends on the pathology and we'll talk a bit about that. Um, so, so these are the main sort of patterns, but this is not with the vocal folds, uh, the false cords vibrating. This is just purely uh, constriction. Um, we know, uh, we've seen this before, that uh, uh, for singing, you've got to get the modes right, and then you can add in these sort of vocal effects uh, here. And um, 
basically, um, the ones we've uh, heard about are the, the, the commonest ones. The ones I'm going to look at is, is distortions of growling, grunting, and rattle. And we see all these effects in patients as well. Um, the tuba, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, that's that sort of uh, uh, um, overtone sort of singing thing. But I'm sure some patients tend to go into that uh, a little bit as well. Um, so um, the, uh, in speech, as I said, um, using the uh, supraglottic uh, structures, this is not the vibration part, but just the constriction, it can be habitual use. Uh, they've just got into a habit of using that voice. Uh, and um, uh, some people use it as character voices as well. Um, uh, and, and that's sort of quite common. Um, but often the ones we see are what we call muscle tension dysphonias, as I said. And that can be a primary muscle tension dysphonia. That's when you do it uh, for when there's no particular reason other than you're, you're constricting in, in the throat. And that has the effect. So when they actually relax and breathe, everything retracts and the larynx looks completely normal. And you know, this is where voice therapy comes in, of course, to, to relieve that tension. But it can also be due to uh, compensation. You have no option. The only way you can get your vocal folds to vibrate or to get any loudness is actually to squeeze really hard uh, to overcome uh, either a glottal gap or uh, a problem with the vocal folds vibrating in terms of stiffness uh, or, or scarring. So um, the, the effects in singing um, are uh, used uh, to characterize um, singers' expressive style and uh, mood, and convey emotion, and they're basically added uh, effects on top of a uh, uh, an underlying uh, um, normal, uh, in the CVT terms, of one of these modes of singing. Um, they, um, there's always this argument about how dangerous they are to the voice, um, but the thing is that these are, uh, and we've looked at the vocal fold vibration underneath, and it's just, as I said, it's an added effect rather than on, on the vocal folds. And there are singers who use it routinely in performing, uh, um, and if it's done correctly, I think the, the risks uh, uh, are, uh, are small as, uh, as long as uh, good precautions are, are, are taken. Um, the, um, <clears throat> so the aim of the study was uh, uh, basically uh, threefold, really. Um, the first was to look and see, uh, in our original study, was to look and see if we could identify um, sort of uh, vibratory patterns uh, with associated with, with each of these sort of these terms. This was the study we did uh, several years ago now. Um, we also used the uh, EGG or laryngograph and acoustic recordings to look at the vocal fold vibration and see what the effect of that was, a surrogate measure uh, of, uh, of uh, abnormal vocal fold uh, vibration. And the third thing um, is just that uh, we, we looked at, uh, at uh, for patients who had similar sort of types of of uh, problem. It was a res retrospective study. So we used the standard sort of uh, endoscopic sort of uh, uh, equipment uh, there and uh, we, um, uh, we looked at 20 singers, uh, trained singers and singing teachers um, and you've seen this is the same cohort of patients that we've reported on uh, 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 previously. So um, they had a range of different sort of singing styles. Some of them were familiar with using the vocal effects and some of them uh, want, but they could, uh, uh, weren't, but they could actually teach uh, the techniques. So in terms of actually how many uh, um, subjects or singers that we were able to uh, see, uh, you can see that distortion was the easiest one for uh, um, out of, 17 out of 20 could, um, could do that, and then um, a, a lot could do uh, the growl. But the growl was actually incredibly difficult to visualize. Um, we got a, a hint of what was going on uh, from that. The rattle, uh, uh, quite a few, uh, only about five could do that. The grunt, um, uh, could, uh, 11 could do it, but only um, three was suitable for sort of analysis. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about the Tuva uh, group there. Um, so um, in distortion, the thing that uh, we noticed most was that the, uh, the false chords came in. I don't know whether we can dim the light a little bit. To, um, just to sort of show the video, because it's a little, little dark. I'll show you another one in a minute. But uh, um, so essentially, um, you can see that um, uh, these are going through the different modes, and you can see that, um, that particularly the false chords 
uh, are, uh, are vibrating. Um, but um, um, so looking at the uh, EGG, which is this sort of green uh, trace uh, there, um, you can see this is. Um, uh, sorry, if you look at the spectrogram first of all, which is at the top uh, here, uh, you can see uh, the sort of the, the uh, overdrive mode here with the, the harmonic structure here, and this is when you've added in uh, the distortion effect, and then you switched off there. Uh, this is the um, uh, contact quotient uh, here of the vocal folds, and you can see there's sort of uh, it's kept fairly constant, uh, but there's just a little bit more sort of variance uh, uh, in it. And if you look at one particular point in detail, uh, there when there's no distortion, you can see this is a nice sort of overdrive type of uh, waveform that we see. Uh, but basically, if you look at the green trace, that's the laryngograph trace, you can see that with the distortion, that the waveform is actually preserved, although the amplitude of it uh, is a little bit variable. So, um, so in terms of actual uh, uh, clinical cases where we see a distortion or distortion-like effect. Uh, again, it's in patients who use uh, the, it habitually in the character voices, and we can see it uh, in these sort of uh, two cases particularly. And it gives a very rough uh, quality to it. Depends if there's a glottal gap as well. If there's a glottal gap, then you get a breathiness on top of the rough effect. But we see this medial uh, constriction, you see this irregular quasi sort of periodic vibration of the vo uh, vocal cords and, uh, and a variable effect depending on what the pathology was. If we look at the character voice, uh, first of all, um, so um, this was taken off the internet about this, the, the top 10 uh, actors with the most annoying voices. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite a listen. <laughs> Uh, I think this ranks uh, uh, pretty high myself, but uh, uh, <laughs> this one. A years ago, I was broke! Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can hear the sound of my voice! Well, you, anyway, you've got the idea of it. It's sort of, uh, basically, that is sort of edge with, with distortion uh, on top of it. But he's made a lot of money, as I said, uh, from that uh, voice. Um, this is a case uh, uh, in clinical practice. This is a chap who's got very scarred vocal cords. And um, you can see the false cords vibrating there. He's got some uh, fairly scarred. You can see them coming in like that. So he's got a very breathy. Um, you can hear. You can hear that. Okay. Um, so we rattle uh, now, um, the, the, we can hear a bit more about this later, but basically it's the arotenoids or arotenoid mucosa uh, that, that's uh, uh, vibrating. And if we just play uh, that. Uh. It's got a different quality sound, it's more of a raspy quality. Um, it can actually be used uh, with distortion, and, uh, and some singers use it sort of uh, routinely. In clinical practice, again, it's the same sort of things. It's uh, uh, why people develop one problem, uh, one way of uh, phonating compared to another, it depends on the, uh, the actual underlying problem to a, a degree. Uh, and uh, how they compensate. But I've got two examples, clinical uh, examples. One, uh, the first one, is a patient who's got a psychogenic muscle tension problem, and she just came in with the most bizarre voice. Uh, and you only get glimpses of it here, uh, but uh, you, you can see, hopefully, the vocal fold vibration. Uh. 
So she's counting. <laughs> it's a little uh, rattly cough uh, there. But, um, uh, sorry. Okay, and this is a patient, uh, a different example. It's a bit dark, but you'll see it. She, this is a lady who had uh, carcinoma, a cancer of the vocal cords. She'd had radiotherapy for that, which uh, uh, unfortunately wasn't successful. But she was actually adamant, because um, the next stage is to actually remove the voice box completely. But she was adamant that she didn't want that, understandably. So there is an operation which is called a supracricoid uh, laryngectomy, where you actually remove uh, the, uh, the vocal folds themselves, but keep the supraglossic structures. And then you have to use those to, to speak. Uh, unfortunately, she uh, had a vo uh, one of the vocal cords wasn't moving as well, but she actually learned to speak. Um, and um, can we turn? So she brings in the vocal fold on that side, but that doesn't actually contribute. It's the actual the the one that's not moving on the left hand side uh, that you can see the arotenoid uh, is is vibrating. Um, but she's got a very breathy quality on top of that because she's got no vocal folds there. And uh, she, she had to be careful with the swallowing, but she, could actually, she didn't actually suffer much from uh, aspiration. Um, so this is a sort of... It's just, we have a debate where this is more a grunt and then a, than a growl, but actually... But, but what you can see there um, is... So, so you can see uh, there's an anterior-posterior uh, narrowing, and you get this sort of areopagotic fold sort of vibrating. Normally you can't see that with most of the patients, we, uh, singers we examine, because the epigotus is far back. That's why it's got a slightly more sort of grunt tone. But there's exactly the same thing that was happening uh, there. And we've got other examples of... Uh, of grunting, which, uh, uh, which is slightly different. But, uh, um, so this was um, Clay, who you heard earlier. Uh, he was amazing. Um, we, one of our studies was we put an endoscope down and he played the, uh, his piano uh, while singing. <laughs> and um, this was the, uh, the video that we took uh, uh, from that, him doing uh, part of it, showing just a <laughs> bit of growling. <laughs> I love that last little girl. <laughs> um, so so um, in growling clinical practice, we see again, some people use it uh, uh, for the same reasons. Uh, the cases that we have, uh, I've seen it particularly, uh, is a patient with a vocal cord palsy. And you see the left side's not moving. Hi. And that's how he, he talked with a growl. Um, that's uncommon for vocal cord pauses, but it's obviously another technique that people use. So, um, grunting, um, it's used a lot in sort of death metal type of uh, singing, and um, uh, we haven't got time to show you an example of it, but perhaps, but uh, I can show you uh, um, the images we got from the study. Here you see a sort of chaotic sort of vibration of the whole of the superglossus. And there, and depending on the extent of the grunting. And uh, if we look at, uh, I haven't unfortunately got a, a patient uh, with that, but I've got um, uh, place once again demonstrating it during singing. Um,
Okay, uh, in grunting, um, it does occur, uh, and in um, the cases we've seen of uh, patients who's, who've had a brainstem stroke, so what happens there is that the vocal folds end up open, they can't bring them together at all. So the ones who haven't had serious neurological consequences, uh, cognitively, who want to actually speak, uh, the way they can learn is to actually uh, use their supraglottis to do that. Obviously, they end up with a very breathy voice, and they can only get odd words out. But they can, some of them can learn to communicate that. The other group that we see is, uh, the, uh, again, who, patients have had extensive laser surgery to the vocal cords, so they don't come together. Um, and the third uh, group uh, is um, in children who've had some uh, narrowing of their, um, of their larynx, uh, usually from intubation. Uh, so they have an operation which basically uh, puts a stent in to widen it so they can breathe. But the, unfortunately, the downside of that is that they can't, uh, they don't often have a good uh, voice. But um, children, are, um, you know, uh, if they want to communicate, they do. They find ways, and they, a lot of them use their supraglottis. But these are the children who come in and they've got a really deep, gravelly voice, you know, in a, in a five-year-old or whatever, um, which is not normal. Of course, that has to be that they're using their false cords uh, uh, to do that. Um, just um, So in summary, uh, basically, uh, uh, for distortion, it's mostly the false cords that are vibrating. In rattle, it's more posterior um, uh, mucosa over the arotenoids. In the growling, it's more areopagotic folds, cuneiforms. Um, and, uh, uh, and in grunting, it's more of the supraglossus. Uh, in general. Obviously there are variations on this and some people use more than one sort of uh, um, uh, 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 part of their, their supraglottis. So in clinical practice we see uh, all these uh, uh, habitual uh, character voices um, uh, and uh, muscle tension dysphonia. Um, but we, what we do is these patients are coming and we have to try and determine whether it's a primary problem or a secondary problem. Um, their voices are not pure rattle, distortion or whatever because often they've got other underlying problems either with a glottal gap or they've got poor respiratory support or other neurological problems. So that's why it's a bit more uh, complex than just the pure uh, forms uh, that we've seen. Um, but I think um, uh, having looked at it, um, it's much easier to work out what's going on and to classify these sort of uh, the ways that, that the supraglottic voice uses. Um, and um, I think uh, one of the other things that uh, advantages uh, of uh, this is that it may be that the techniques that uh, the, the teachers use uh, to train singers could actually be useful for speech pathologists to show them how to regain voices in these sort of difficult uh, um, situations. So thank you very much. Thank you.